Um, are you all are you all in software development? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, do you, would you raise your hand if you have used Scrum? <laughs> And so the others of you are, are kind of interested in this. And so this might be um, more basic. But the topic we're going to talk about um, today is not just a scrum topic. It's a, it's a way of communicating with people. Um, and it's about the word done or fini in French. And, um, Fini in it or done is a way in a long period of a, a time of setting expectations that we can know that certain things um, have been completed and we can expect that certain things are in place. So, for instance, if you were at um, a favorite football game and you were cheering your team on and um, time elapsed and your team had won, one to zero, and the game was done, you knew that your team had won. But if the other team suddenly rushed out on the field and kicked in a goal, and, and the referee then said, wait, it's now a tie, you'd say, no, that's not fair because the game was done. So done just in communicating with people is a way of setting an expectation that that's over, now we can move on to something new. And this is really important in software development um, because our customers um, pay us money and want to have us build software for them. And of course, one of their expectations is they want to know um, when we are done. And that is kind of a loose phrase or a weird phrase because that to them means it's solved, it works, it does everything expected. It meets all my needs. Yeah, plus, uh, if we uh, mean the same thing, that's good. If it's not, if we mean something different, um, usually that's a where you have conflict. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, about the word done in soft development and done in the, um, in the process of Scrum because it's a critical, um, simple but critical phrase. I'm going to share my screen with you and just go through a short PowerPoint. And then um, to the degree that um, there's any unanswered um, items we can talk about. So let me see if I can um, get this up. Um, share screen. You should be able to right now see my entire screen. Um, is that true? Ha! Ah, good, that's done. <laughs> see? If you say, well, but then I wouldn't know what it meant. So we're going to talk a little bit about done and undone and its importance in talking with people about software. Now, I don't know if... if um, how many of you are familiar with this? But back in 2001, um, 17 uh, software developers got together and, and came up with something called the Agile Manifesto, which is a, a set of values and principles that we thought should guide software development in working with our customers. And one of the very first things, the highest principle that we came up with was our highest priority is to satisfy our customer to the early and continuous delivery of valuable software. That is, if we have a customer that comes to us and says, really, really, really need a system that will um, modulate or handle the way we move traffic, air traffic through here better, um, and we say to them, well, that'll take us five years, probably that's not what they want. Um, five years may be okay, but they want to start getting parts of it early and they want to get parts of it that they can get value from early. So that's one of our, our basic premises. And Scrum is a way of 
making that true. So the whole, one of the whole bases of Scrum is never the most valuable, soft, or faster than the traditional um, software development approaches of which the classic one is waterfall. Now with waterfall, um, we do everything that we need to build software um, in sequence. So we start, we plan with the um, customer that wants this new traffic control system, and then we design it, and then we start coding it. Do you notice by then we've, we've been a lot of things going on, the money's been spent, but don't need anything that can help them manage your traffic yet. So we even test it then, and then we finally release it to them. So they can start looking at it, we review what they want, we make it work so that it works with one. And then they have this working software. Now that's been a lot of time. And the problem with that a lot of time is they've been spending a lot of money and they're not sure that what they're going to get is what they want. And the other problem with it is the, the requirements may have changed during that time. Their needs, their ways, um, we have new GPS system, we have new ways of delivering um, what they want. So what we've done with Scrum and um, Steve Chi, uh, Agile, is instead we have Scrum which within one time, so before we might sit at 12 months, within one, just one month, we do everything that we did in Waterfall. We plan, we analyze, we design, we code, we test, we release, and we review, and we give them a piece of working software, working software that they can use for their needs. So we've done everything we did before, but we've done it in much less time. Now, of course, you know, there's not magic involved in that. In order to do that, we have to do that with fewer requirements. So if they had 528,000 requirements before, and we said, well, in a month, maybe we can only give you 50 or 60, but we can give you land, analyze, design, code, release, a few, all of them, and you can start using them. They say, oh, well, it's not as much as what I would prefer, but the fact that I can start using it is very, very quick. And can you do that for again? So what we do with Trump is we have these relations of one month or less, Typically, we let's say it's a two-week iteration where we build a whole piece of software, and then we build another piece of software and another piece of software, and we keep doing this until our customer said, says to us, that's good enough, that's fine, thank you very much, I have the software that I need. And so we've been iteratively, let's say every two weeks, giving them a piece of software, an increment of software that builds on the prior increments, and what we have at the end of the months is an iterative incremental approach to building four increments of software that gives them their air traffic control system. Maybe even a fifth if they want more. So this is a very, very different approach. It allows them to see the software early. It allows them to change their mind. So after a second set of software, that we can convert them, they can see, oh, I changed my mind what I want next. We can give them something different. If after the first set of software, they say, you know, you're not very good at developing software. I don't want to spend any more money on you. Um, they've continued for just one um, iteration's worth of expenditure. So this gives our um, customers far more control and far more value um, than before. However, um, when we talk to them, we have to use the word done correctly for this to occur. So software development, iterative incremental, if it's Scrum, where these blue circles are iterations, and what we're dropping at the end of every iteration is a done increment of working functionality. And at the end of the second increment iteration, we had the first increment to the second one, the third to the second first, fourth to the third thing. And what we're doing is building it up until our customer says, that's it, that's done, that's excellent, thank you. 
So let's look at how this might change the way we work with our customer. Um, our customer typically doesn't come to us and say, uh, this is exactly what I want. They say, um, I'm looking for a new system to transfer funds from the world. And you said, you can kind of show them and say, okay, so you've got a requirement to do this and you've got a requirement to do that. So, no, 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 I've also got a requirement to do this. And we start looking at all the requirements that they've got and the size of these um, rectangles might represent the effort or the size of the requirement we're thinking. And we're talking to them and we, we're gathering their requirements. And they say, well, this is nice. They enjoy our conversation, but where are you going to start giving me some software? We say, oh, okay. Uh, what I need to know first from you, oh, customer, is what is the most important piece of software that you want to build? That is, what do you want to give you first? And the customer looks, talks to us and says, well, I think it's that piece of software. We say, okay, we can build that piece of software. First, but, um, wow, if we build that piece of software first, um, are you going to need this other piece of software to use that piece of software? So, oh, yeah, 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 you're right. Okay, so let's do that one first. Um, but we're still going to do the second one. We say, of course, of course, we have to do this first. first. You say, okay. And you say, but just to even do this first, we need to start playing some stuff. So we've got to do this. So we have a conversation going on back and forth between the customer and ourselves about everything they might need in the system and which order they would like us to deliver it. Now, this is still a, a working um assumption that this is what they want. But what we've done is we've taken all of the requirements that they know at this time, we've kind of listed them, and we've ordered them based on how critical they are, how important they are, how risky, how much risk needs to be removed. And we have a vague, vague set of requirements. Listen, the only requirement that's absolutely critical to us, though, is the first one, because that's what we're turning to software. So we said, so we, we have um, understood what you need. Um, do you want us to build this? And they say, yes. And we said, okay, we charge you um, $36,000 United States dollars per month. Um, we will build you some of the software in one month. And they said, how much? We said, wait, it'll be about this much. Uh, we'll see. They said, well, I need to know in detail. We said, well, you're only risking $36,000. Let's see. So we take and we, across time with the bottom, we see what's, we see what's going to happen. And the very first month, we build one small increment of software, which presents these requirements. Now we still have all of these requirements below that we haven't done. And the customer though, at the end of the first month, is look at that working piece of software and say, that's, you know, they get to make up their mind about whether that's what they want. They get to make up their mind about whether what their money they're spending is reasonable for that software. And also they get to then say what they want us to do next. One of the options, of course, is plus that they don't want to do anything else. But another might be, okay, now that you've done that one piece of software, I would like you to go ahead and build these pieces of software over here. So and we, another month was by and we work and we build some more software for them. And we add that software to the first software that we've done, of course, because they want the whole thing. And at the end of that second spring period, they now have more software that they have in. And what we see is now there are fewer requirements that are undone that are still outstanding. And we can keep doing that month by month, building more software for them and the amount of software that they have that they can use grows. And the amount of software that they you know they need but don't, don't have to have starts to finish. So bit by bit, what they're getting is working useful software. They can even create a trend line of how fast they're getting their working software. And if they keep that trend line and they move it from no software delivered through software being built, you can even start to anticipate it's not a certain thing. They can start anticipating when all of this is likely to be done. Now, the only reason they're able to do that is we have delivered actual valuable working software to them. And what they're objecting is a trend 
of how soon the actual valuable working software is available to get them to a point where they can actually use it for their business purpose. And this is the, the whole basis of Scrum. The um, trust that a customer and the software developer get, uh, they know what's happening because they're getting done software that's of value for the money that they anticipate. Now, here's a key study that we ran into of this, um, this situation not working quite the way we anticipated. And this was back early in the days of Scrum, maybe from 2002, at a company called TransCanada Pipelines in Calgary, um, Canada. And what they had was um, they had listed all their requirements that they, we could think of in this vertical. And we had laid out a timeline across the bottom. And based on our back work with, we had laid out a projected, the dotted line is a projection of when we thought things would be done. Now that's just a guess. And we call them, we have to see, you know, sprint by sprint work. So after the first sprint, sure enough, there we are. We had actually done one sprint's worth of work and we had one increment that was done. And that was right on the trend line. So thank heavens, our, our anticipated plan is still true. So they said, okay, this looks good. We have to do another iteration or sprint's worth of work. And we did that. And we were still on the trend line. So it looked like the amount of money they had planned was going to become true. It was consistently done at that date. And at the end of the third month, they said again, we're still on the trend line. The amount of requirements were done as well anticipated. And our customer then said something very surprising. They said, this is really, really good and useful. We now see that we can start using some of this before we have all of it. So these three pieces of software given to us, what we'd like to do is start using them. And we said, oh, that's really, really good, um, but you can't. And they said, well, why not? Um, you, you've shown us each one, they all work together. We said, well, we show them to you and they're really there, but they're really not ready for use. They're not done. They said, what do you mean, done? They said, I see it here. I can play with it. I can use it. We said, well, you can, but it's got a lot of bugs in it. And actually, the data that's being entered isn't being saved in a way that's usable. And there are some other problems in that the performance and the scalability and the security isn't what's needed. I said, wait a second. You've been showing us this, and you've been telling us this is done. And we've, of course, assumed that done means it's usable for us for a purpose. And we said, well, we, that's not what we really meant. What we really meant was it was just, you know, really usable um, in terms of a demonstration. They said, oh, okay, so, so how much work have you really done? We said, well, what we've really done is shown on this line. That is, we really haven't done all of this. We haven't done scalability. We haven't done security. We haven't done the data. Uh, transition. We haven't done all these other things. We've only done this. And they said, oh my God, this is horrible. So we thought we could use this and we can't. We thought we were on plan. And if we really follow your plan, what we've got is we're not going to be done till out here. They said, so, so there hasn't been this transparency, this, um, doneness that we thought was there. And he said, so what we need to do is we need to plan how much work really means. And we need to come up with a definition of, with you, of when you show us a piece of software at the end of a sprint, what is it really? That is, we want it done so we can use it. So when you say that it's done and we say we really want to use it, it's really done. So we need you to do all the work needed to do that. This would be like someone building a skyscraper and you saying, ah, you're done, and then you lean against the wall and it falls over. Not good. So um, this, this was our first problems we ran into in Scrum. At the end of the iteration, what really is the increment so that we are talking the same language as our customers? So that when you have a sprint, you have an increment at the end of it, the increment must 
be really done in both people's language, must be potentially achievable or usable by the stakeholder. That is, if I say, is there any more work to be done on this, this awkward moment? They can say, no, it's really done. And this, this includes things like, um, let me look at this. This includes things like um, all of the planning and all of the building being done. Because what happens if you aren't done at the end of every sprint is you reach the end. What's, what's happening is undone work is accumulated. So all the tests that you haven't done, all of the refactoring that you haven't done, all of the code to integrate the pieces that you have done accumulates. And it accumulates in by bit sprint by sprint until when you are supposedly done, you not only are you have some work software that's working, but you also have a whole lot of work that remains to be done. And so typically there's then at that point something called between software called a stabilization phase and which our customers they call really making it work the way I intended in the first place. And that completely undone undoes what we're looking for in um, software development. So what we're really looking for in the iteration is for these software developers to do everything from analysis, design, detailed design, refactoring of design, unit testing, acceptance testing, testing, screen test, um, documentation, uh, checking for cyclomatic complexity and reducing it. You know, all those things you need to really make a working done piece of software. And when we first tell a team that they have to do all of that in a sprint, their first comment is, you have to be kidding me. That's an incredible amount of work. And we saw this at um, an organization called Hobby. And some of you use their software. Um, with Adobe situation, we have a product called Creative Suite. And many of you may use it. It's, it's a fairly significant piece of software. And they built Creative Suite with 120 people, and they were using eight teams from teams. And in the first release, each one of the 18 teams built its own piece of software. And if you look at this chart on the right, what we have on the vertical axis is the number of defects that are accumulating across time, and we have time on the bottom. And the dotted line is the planned release date for release one. So in the very first release, what we had with each of the 18 sprints, uh, each 18 teams building a piece of software. But they told us that they did not have time within the sprints to integrate their work with each other's work. So they never pulled the code together and they never tested whether the code with one team worked with the other team. And so what happened is in this release, if you look at this bottom line, you see them going along, building work and building work, some defects um, be reported, some defects be reported. And then we reached the point in time about halfway through the release where we said, let's try integrating all 18 instruments. And what happened is we discovered an incredible number of defects that were made because we had never tried to see if they were there. The number of defects went up incredibly, and we had to put all, all the 18 teams on four time working weekends and things like that to try to get the um, results out by the planned day. And what happened is they were able to reduce the number of defects. Um, the planned day came. They were past due, it was in the marketplace, it was in the press as um, an overdue release. And yet, by the time they finally released, it was seen as a terrible, terrible release because it was bugs and it was past due. In the second um, release, Paul talked to all the teams, we said, we know this seems really difficult, it seems very slow, but we need you to talk to each other all during every sprint make sure all of your work works together, that your code does not overlay each other, that it integrates, and that you test that it works together as one integrated shippable whole. He said, well, we'll never be able to do that. That's going to take too long. He said, well, let's see. And so if you look at the second release, 
um, they were integrating all their ET um, increments everywhere. And you can see that there were defects, again, rose, but it never spiked because they were continually checking that it really worked. And they got done with all of the work before these things, and they actually released the product early, and it had no defects in it. So this is actually counterintuitive. It felt to them when they were doing the extra work of integrating and checking all the work during the second release that they were never going to get done. But what happened was because they were actually doing all the work all the time bit by bit, they never had this undone buildup of work that came back to them and caused them to lose their day. So this was actually very counterintuitive. It became part of the way that they work. We've um, had a lot of, I'm sure you've, you've seen it too, where um, we now have the ability to um, have driverless cars, driverless tractors. We have um, software where we have group networking. We have incredible amounts of new software. You, if you have a um, smartphone in your pocket, it's probably updating itself while you're sitting. And all of this has been driven by the ability to iterative keep work. You can trust updating your hardware whenever. And since the actual decade has been driven by the ability to develop done increments of capability. And because we know they're done, we know that they actually work and are safe to immediately deploy and utilize these new capabilities. And we know that we see, as we're putting them out, that they work according to the service level agreements. And we can put them out into the cloud. We can put them out into virtualized operation capabilities. I'm taking delivery of a car within three or four days, and it has many new capabilities like ability to see with its plane, to watch out for collisions, to break or to watch out for pedestrians. The software to run that car is downloaded to it whenever it's ready, and it updates the car's capabilities. It's only possible if the ability to fuss and build government software. So, um, I hope that this has been an interesting and helpful talk. The main topic is that um, our capability, our engineering capabilities to build done complete software, every iteration, iterations are often sometimes now maybe two weeks, maybe two weeks. Some organizations do eight or nine releases a day. Um, and all that's done by our engineering capability to complete done pieces of software. And guess what? That's it. You can well, very I much. hope that makes sense. Is there anybody has a question? Or maybe they are too tired. <laughs> we, we, it's a, it was, uh, thank you very much. It was sometime we have a small uh, slowdown on the internet connection, but uh, uh, it was very interesting topics about uh, definition of down and especially the example of what the, you mean exactly. And uh, we would like to, uh, uh, questions. Hello, Mr. Ken. Hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Uh, second Thanks. of all, I'd like to ask you not something specific to your presentation, but a general over uh, question about Scrum. Uh, nowadays, uh, you can see we're in a fast uh, pace in technology. Everything's moving fast. Uh, everyone wants to deliver quickly. Everyone is going into Agile, and everyone's thinking of implementing Agile. And many companies are taking Scrum as an agile uh, methodology. Uh, but we also see that there is many confusion into, uh, as in how Scrum is implemented. Uh, because as we can, maybe we can see, there is no set, set of rules and regulations that are specific to this kind of methodology. 
And we see them mixing up methodologies, as we've heard many times, uh, the new, uh, let's call it, uh, it's called, I think, Kanban, and now there's a Scrum ban. So uh, as uh, the agile guru, <laughs> if I may say, uh, what's, um, what are the key factors that any software company uh, needs to keep in mind, uh, especially new startups, when they want to implement Scrum as an agile uh, methodology? Thank you. So, um, a, a clarification. There is a place on the website, on the web, called scrumguides.org. And there we have the definition of Scrum. It's about 16 pages long, and we have maybe 20 translations of it. And that is it. There is no more. It's a very, very, very simple process. Um, and it's not even a methodology. We call it a framework because a methodology would tell you what to do. Scrum simply says, you have some requirements, select the most important of them, um, have a fixed time interval, turn those requirements into something that your customer can use, and at the end of that iteration, see what your customer wants to do next. It doesn't tell you how to do that. It doesn't tell you um, how the meeting should be conducted. All of those things are completely up to you because every organization is different. Even within an organization, every group is different. Some customers may be harsh, some may be, um, want to be conciliatory and work closely with you. Some teams that are building software may be really, really good and be able to build a lot of it. Some teams might be awful. Um, the circumstances are completely different in every situation. And so we have Scrum as just a very, very small frame, and it says, try using this and see how it goes. If you, your customer doesn't want to work with you very well, then this is an issue for you to work on because if they don't want to see what they're paying for, it's a good idea to somehow resolve that. If you can't build testable software, maybe it's a good thing for you to work on. So Scrum, um, are, are, are any of you married? This is a weird question. Uh, okay. Um, Scrum, it's like inviting your mother-in-law. You know, the mother-in-law who always thought that her son or daughter would have married better to come live with you so that she can tell you how you can be a better person. <laughs> when you start using Scrum, it first of all says, tell me what your most important requirement is. And the customer goes, uh, I don't know, I just want it all. <laughs> Suddenly they have to tell you what's most important. You have to actually build it. And that means you have good engineering software skills to do so, right? And you have a development environment in which, and so it's just like the mother-in-law who's saying, well, you know, you're, you're a pretty good daughter-in-law, but you know, your code sucks. <laughs> so, so Scrum itself doesn't tell you how to do those things, but it sets up framework within which you know how well you're doing them. Now, there are many, many people in the world that need money. And they've come up with things like Scrum Bond and Safe and all these things. And these are all things which they say, if you use this, this will tell you how to do it properly. But the question is, how would they possibly know if they've never worked in your company with your fellow employees before? So the, the good thing and bad thing about Scrum is it doesn't tell you how to do things, but the bad thing is you have to figure it out yourself what works best in your environment. And like the mother-in-law, it'll always give you feedback about how well you're doing. And when you get good enough, maybe the mother-in-law will die and you'll have a good life. Hard to say. So don't spend money on, on people who say, I know the answer for you, because they don't. Thank you very much. And uh, the question, where, where? Hello, Mr. Ken. Uh, my, qu Hello. my question is, how mature is Scrum for non-software projects? 
because every time we use Scrum, we use software projects. And I know that you already put an example. How mature is Scrum in a non-software project? Yeah, my, in the back of the room, keep here, can you stay down? The question was about um, the, um, how we, we can use Scrum uh, in non-software industry. How Scrum is mature in a non-software industry. In a what environment? I'm going to type it. Uh, Scrum and currently outside of the software industry. Exactly. Uh, um, so my focus has always been the software industry, but um, it is being used more and more often um, to help people get control of complex situations. So for instance, IBM uses it for their digital media, for their advertising, and they have scrum teams that consist of people in marketing, advertising, and web development that work together. Um, every organization uses the equivalent of Scrum because they, on a monthly basis, um, pull together their revenues and expenses and assess how well they're doing. Um, people who live in a totally chaotic environment. Um, a friend of mine, um, his daughter is a school teacher in Philadelphia in the inner city, which is a very, very dangerous horrible place to grow up and what that what she's taught the kids to do is to use scrum to rather than worry about what's happening in their whole life and will they ever grow up and be successful is to take and look at small pieces of their life and set small goals and see what their progress thank everyone very much for being there i will ask the support team and the speakers to stand up and we need to First of all, to clap all the audience for attending this con. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy your day. Thank you for staying so long and uh, have an agile year and see you next year.